everybody. My name is Matthias Reisinger, and I'm super excited to talk to you today uh, at the Entrepreneurship Avenue uh, around the topic on how to invest where impact is the greatest. And um, now I know that most of you probably are not investors, but even as a startup, as an entrepreneur, it's really great to know how do they think, right? What do we need to show and prove so that they actually invest in my idea? Uh, a little bit about myself. At the moment, I am the head of department of entrepreneurship and creative industries at AWS. AWS is um, Austria's public funding agency. So amongst other things, our job is to invest in innovative ideas uh, and also into innovative ideas that focus on impact. In my previous life for the last 10 years, um, I was an entrepreneur myself. I'm one of the co-founders of the Impact Hub Vienna, which I also ran as a managing director. Uh, so I know a little bit about starting, getting the first uh, miles and uh, the first fundings and have worked a lot with impact investors, with foundations, with banks, and now funding also as AWS. So I'm happy to share uh, my insights and what I think is most important for you. Uh, but about my previous job as an entrepreneur, uh, most of you probably have uh, heard about um, the Impact Hub uh, and um, uh, it's Austria's largest community of impact entrepreneurs. Um, it started pretty much exactly 10 years ago and now has a membership of over 600 members. Uh, it's a 1,600 square meter space. And every year, approximately 100 startups are incubated, are supported by specialized programs. And, uh, but it did not always look like this shiny picture that you can see here in the beginning. It very much looked like this, right? So it was an empty space and, and uh, there's a long journey until we arrived in this space. Uh, this is how it looked like in the January of 2010. But then together with our community, together with friends, uh, we renovated this space. Uh, we actually made it into this first space where people that had ideas how to change the world or social innovators, uh, impact startups come, come together, learn from each other uh, and have more impact together. Uh, and so uh, in May 2010, uh, it looked like this. We opened uh, here, you can see in the presence of Nobel Peace Prize laureate Mohammed Yunus uh, to a large audience and uh, started our journey from there. Um, and this is how it looked soon after. So um, I know a little bit about the, the rough beginnings, especially when nobody believes in your idea. And I'm happy to answer your questions on how it started exactly afterwards in the Q&A. But now, before I go into the how to in invest in where the impact is the greatest or how do impact investors think about it, I wanted you to really also have one thing in, in the back of your heads, and that is that the funding mix is different for every project. Um, so every project is different, it has a different business model, it has a different impact models. So the funding, how do you get the money to actually realize that idea also looks different uh, for every project. And it, it could uh, theoretically look like this or a variation of this. So you'll probably start in the beginning with your own savings uh, and what is called the family fools and friends. So who in the, in the very early stage, maybe the first 50K, 50,000 euros, who can you convince in order uh, to actually put down a little bit of money uh, for yourself uh, to get going? If you're lucky and, and you fit into a public funding program, such as the AWS that we give out, you can apply for a public grant uh, if your idea is innovative and there is a, a convincing model behind it. It's very likely that you will be able to get some public funding for it. For some project, it makes sense to uh, actually get a bank loan. And yeah, we know how difficult it is at the moment for entrepreneurs to get a loan. But especially if you're in the impact space, there's special loans where, for example, the European Investment Fund says uh, to banks, please invest uh, or give loans to uh, social innovators and impact startups. We'll take some of the risk. So it's not even that impossible to get it. Uh, it's actually quite likely if you have a convincing model. For some projects, it, it's best if you use crowdfunding and crowd lending. So... Uh, approach your community or a, a new community out there to invest into your product, uh, your service, um, or to give you a loan um, themselves. And then one aspect that I want to talk more about today is impact investors. Um, they'll actually invest in your company. So they'll take a stake, they get a little bit of equity, so a little part of your uh, company, and they hope to get either a dividend over a long time or to benefit if they, uh, if you have an exit uh, and sell your company to somebody else, which also uh, is happening in the impact space. There's more and more projects that actually have an, have an exit uh, and where then the impact investors get a share of that. 
or philanthropic money by philanthropists. So that can be individuals or foundations that give you a donation um, because they believe in the cause and they believe in your project. And it can be a mix of all of these things. So uh, it's very much dependent on, um, on your own project and how you actually put together this funding mix. Um, and independent of, uh, of that, I wanted to just show you. So this is how we at the Impact Hub started. We, we started with a little bit of money that we had ourselves. And then we, uh, we came out right off the, off the university. Uh, I'm a graduate of the Vienna Business University myself. And we kind of convinced our family to give us a little bit of money every month as if we were still students for one year. And if it wouldn't work after a year, we said, okay, we'll actually get a decent job. Uh, so this is how we started in the beginning. We applied for a lot of public funding, but unfortunately, even though we thought this was the most amazing idea in the world, it didn't fit into any of these buckets of public funding uh, innovation grants. So we had to find a different way. Back then, the, the field of impact investors was really not comparable to how it is today. So we said the only way for us is actually to go to a bank. And yes, we were 24. We had a crazy idea that people didn't really understand in the beginning, but we still managed to convince a bank to give us a loan. So at the age of 24, I underwrote uh, a quite a substantial six-digit figure bank loan um, uh, to get us started. And, and this is how we did. Five years later, when we expanded and we tripled in space, we convinced, uh, again, a bank to invest in it, uh, but also we approached our community. So we talked to individuals and said, hey, this is our idea. This is our, our vision. Do you want to be a part of that story? And, um, and it was amazing. The resonance was so beautiful. Uh, many, many individuals said, we believe in your idea. We believe in you and we want to be a part of it. We give you a small loan. And again, it actually added up to quite a substantial uh, six-digit uh, um, loan in the end, uh, in total. Um, independent of who you uh, talk to, um, you'll probably have to demonstrate this to all the individuals, if it's a bank, if it's a foundation, if it's your family, uh, uh, you'll, they'll ask you the same questions or you'll, you'll have to prove them uh, these, same, uh, these same points. Uh, I'll focus on impact investors uh, because those uh, really take a stake and they take a lot of risk. Um, so what do they look at? And the first part obviously is the innovation itself, right? And in the impact space, we don't look at the innovation in itself, uh, but we very much look at it in the context of the challenge that, uh, that you want to address. So how significant is the challenge that the team is addressing, right? Is it a challenge that is only focused on uh, a small amount of people in, a, in your region, or is it actually a global challenge? So um, both are fine, but naturally the, the more people uh, or the, the bigger part of the planet is affected, by the challenge, uh, the biggest impact potential, right? So how significant is the challenge that, uh, that you are addressing? And then as a second question, how much does your solution help to solve that challenge, right? Does it actually make a difference? And you could really say that it's, it adds uh, a big part to the solution of the challenge, or it doesn't, even, doesn't it even scratch the, the surface and doesn't it even sort of make a dent in it? Last but not least, especially if it's uh, about taking quite a risk, uh, what impact investors do is, is there any way, shape or form that you can demonstrate that this works, right? And this is why I, I believe so much in the power of prototypes, right? Not only because you can start collecting uh, evidence that your idea actually works, uh, you learn so much and you stop wasting time on assumptions that uh, you only hope that they are true. Uh, so you can actually go out there and, uh, and actually see if it works. And I want to stress this because I, I see this over and over again, especially in Austria and the German-speaking world. Uh, I see teams that still invest so much time, resources, and energy in things that they hope will actually make a difference. But often it turns out that nobody wants it or nobody needs it. So I urge you, instead of polishing that website, polishing that folder, working on your business cards and attending a lot of events, I, I urge you start with the prototype, go out there, speak to your customers as soon as possible, speak to your beneficiaries as soon as possible, test your hypothesis, test your assumptions and integrate that feedback. Don't get distracted by the things that make you comfortable and that are, that are nice to deal with, but go into that discomfort and prototype, uh, even if it's, it feels embarrassing. Uh, I love the story of Zappos, and um, maybe 
uh, you have heard this story. It was one of the first online shops that sold shoes at a time when it was inconceivable that you could even sell shoes online. And so what the founder did is he, he went to Foot Locker, a shoe store, and he talked to them and says, is it okay if I take pictures of your shoes? And if some, I put them on a website and if somebody buys them, I'll run to you and I'll buy the shoe from you. And Foot Locker said, well, sure, go ahead, do that. So he did just that. He took the pictures, he put them on a website. It was a, an ugly website. It only cost him a couple of thousand euros. So it was super cheap, but it was functional. It worked, right? And as soon as somebody clicked on the website and says, I want to have that shoe, he ran to Foot Locker, he bought that shoe and then he shipped it. So not only did he prove that it works so that people actually buy shoes online, uh, but he learned so much about the process. So how do I deal with shipment? How do I deal with uh, if uh, people complain, if they send them back? So he built the prototype and thereby could validate that the basic idea could work. And fast forward a couple of years later, he sold that idea for more than 800 million uh, to Amazon. So I urge you to step into the discomfort and, uh, and test it as soon as possible with actual customers and beneficiaries. The second team obviously is the, uh, the second part is obviously the team, right? And naturally they look at, do the, does the team have the skills and the competency, competencies to pull it off, right? Obviously. Do they have all the competences and the experience in the team or do they have partners that can support them if they don't have it? But I want to say even more important is do they have a vision, right? And are they burning for the idea? Because it's going to be a tough journey. So my, my recommendation to you as well is find an idea that you feel really excited about that you could see yourself being married to for the next five, five to 10 years because it is going to probably take this amount of time for you to succeed or to see if it works or not. And uh, the investors that invest in you, they want to see the same thing as well. Um, then it's, it goes hand in hand with which what I said before is, does the team focus on execution or they do they distract themselves and procrastinate, right? And I think working on shiny folders and working on a shiny website and building a lot of features without testing them with real customers and real, real beneficiaries is, as to some extent, uh, distraction and procrastination. Uh, the teams that are most successful, and you can see this all across the board, even in Austria, they focus on execution. So they focus on their product, they test it as soon as possible with customers, um, and then they, they integrate that feedback and go on. And uh, another part of the team is, are they able to run a sustainable organization? And I don't only mean financially sustainable, naturally, but I also mean in terms of the culture and with people. So what does it mean? For me, it means paying a decent salary, right? And we know in the beginning it is, it is tough. We, we earn less than we could uh, earn somewhere else, but does it go somewhere where it's a decent salary or do we keep exploiting the people that work with us? Um, because if we exploit people, uh, ultimately they'll run away and we lose the, the talent, we lose the competences and we lose the best people that we, uh, we need in order to execute that idea. Are they creating a culture of well-being or are they creating a, a culture of burnout? I'm a, I'm a, I'm not a big fan of this um, idea that we need to constantly be overworked and fatigued. I think it doesn't really lead to the most impact. If we want to have a positive impact, we also need to make sure that we are uh, in a good space. So it's, uh, it's really important to sleep. It's really important to take the time off. It's really important to take care of yourself. And are they able to create a healthy uh, culture or are they creating a toxic culture, right? Just look at how many startup teams are splitting up because of fighting, because of indifferences. So I think the culture is one of the most important things and that you as a leader need to work on. If you create a structure where people feel empowered, they feel hurt, there's an open feedback culture and, a, and an open culture where we talk about disagreements as well. So are you able to run a sustainable uh, organization? So I believe a meaningful innovation uh, combined with an excellent team, this is the maximum impact. So if you can demonstrate these elements to a bank, uh, to a foundation, but also to an impact investor, uh, they will actually um, be comfortable enough to invest in you, even if it's risky. Uh, two more things, uh, which I believe is important for you to know. If you are a student and if you are between uh, 18 and 26, actually we expanded it to 30 years old, and you have an idea, you can apply for the obvious first program you can see it again, uh, after summer, uh, we will actually pay uh, a small stipend and a budget, which amounts to 40,000 uh, euros in total. 
we'll provide you with trainings and workshops. So it's a one-year experience uh, where you really learn how to take the first steps as an entrepreneur. Uh, and some of the most amazing teams that we currently see in Austria have gone through this program. Uh, so if you want to learn more about it, go to the website or you can write me directly. Second thing is the obvious creative impact call. If you have an impact idea uh, in the very early stage, uh, you can get up to 50K for a prototype or 200K for the go-to-market um, step. Uh, again, there's more information on the website. I think those are the most important for you to know. If you have more questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. You can also ask me now in the Q&A. And, and this is it. Uh, I hope that there were some uh, interesting nuggets for you uh, to take away. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to hear from you now or to get your questions uh, via email um, on this address. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your great presentation. We have a few questions from the audience. So the first one is, how do you actually find an idea that will make an impact if you know your field but don't know where to contribute? Right. Um, let me just tell our own story. So it, it started, we were in the end of our, um, of our studies and we like, so what are we going to do next, right? And we, we said, we didn't really wanna go to a big corporation and, and work there, but we really wanted to make our own, uh, start our own project and, and, and make sure that we have the impact that we want to achieve. And so we got a bunch of our friends that were interested in the same idea. Together, we brainstormed for uh, one weekend we stepped away with some first preliminary ideas, but then, and this is, I think, my recommendation, we just started, right? We, just, we started to see, does this work? Um, are we good at it? Are we not good at it? Are people paying us for it? Are they not paying us for it? Uh, does it make a difference? Or does it not make a difference? What happens is that you learn by doing. Uh, and the second thing that happens is a lot of people will actually give you really helpful recommendations. Have you talked to that? Person. Have you seen that uh, that uh, presentation? Have you read that book, or have you actually talked to that organization? So iteratively, we uh, we learned and we integrated this feedback. We followed what we felt was the right mix for us, uh, and ultimately that led us uh, to two years later uh, come up with the idea to start the Impact Hub in Vienna and actually to it part of a global network. Um, so my recommendation is start somewhere and experiment. Throw out ideas that you're not excited about, uh, throw out ideas that you realize you're not good at and nobody's going to pay you for. And uh, if you follow that journey, uh, you'll see that step by step, you'll end, land somewhere where in your field that you're passionate about, uh, you'll actually make a difference. A second recommendation is, again, it, and this is so important in the impact space, find something that you realize you're really excited about. Uh, there's a beautiful story of a, of a young Latin American entrepreneur. She was decently successful with an idea where she was dealing with uh, climate change. And then in one workshop where she's talking to a lot of other uh, social innovators, uh, she realized that they all were super excited uh, about their ideas, but she actually felt quite drained. So she took a step back and she realized that she was not, even though she realized it was a, a big problem, climate change, she was more excited to work with underprivileged children. So she completely uh, shifted focus. She followed that, which she felt excited about. And now she is making the most amazing impact in Latin America when it comes to working with underprivileged children. And I believe it's because as well, she's excited about it. So find something that you could really see yourself being excited about for the next couple of years, because this is probably how long it's gonna take to, uh, to actually succeed. All right, and one more short question because we're a bit over time. Uh, sure. What can you actually do if a prototype is too expensive to build? If you can don't you have the, the question? what can you do when building a prototype is too expensive or not viable right now? Well, I'm, so I think there's two approaches. First, I had this conversation with many entrepreneurs. Um, it's, they usually overestimate how much it, uh, it takes to prototype uh, an idea. A prototype can look very, uh, have very different shapes and forms. It doesn't necessarily build something. So for example, for us at the Impact Hub, our prototype was not to rent out uh, a 400 square meter space, which at the end it was. It was creating that experience uh, for the community without that space being there, right? So we hosted a lot of events. We hosted conferences, we hosted workshops, we hosted networking events. So we kind of replicated that experience in much cheaper format and then use that as an evidence that people would actually uh, enjoy that experience in, an, in a fixed location as well. Um, so that's that's uh, number one. I think there is always 
a very affordable and cheap way to prototype your assumption because it's the assumption that you want to test if it creates value uh, and if people are willing uh, to pay for it. And it's not necessarily the machine or the infrastructure in itself necessarily. The second one is if it's too expensive to prototype, well, uh, again, can you convince somebody to invest in you in an early stage? Is it family, fools, and friends? Is it maybe a, a funding program like the Creative Impact program that I, uh, that I suggested before where you can get up to 50K to actually fund your prototype as well? Or is it a bank or is it an impact investor or a foundation uh, to fund that program uh, in the early stages? But before you go there, my uh, assumption is that there is usually a very cheap way to, to have a first initial test of the assumptions uh, that you want to test with your prototype. Thank you so much for your interesting talk and your great answer. It was really, really cool. Okay, right now I would ask every one of our viewers to go to the startup stage and watch our amazing pitch award and see who is going to win. So awesome. thank you again and thank you for being part of the Avenue 2020. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Bye. All right, bye. Bist du bereit fürs nächste?